Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first uh, Lunch and Learn program by, um, by the RHC Information Group. Um, this is the Rural Health Clinic Program Evaluation. It is sponsored by North American Healthcare Management Services with Charles James and uh, his group. And today's date is February the 10th, 2022 is the date of recording of the session. My name is Mark Lynn. I'm a CPA from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, that's worked with Rural Health Clinic Pro the Rural Health Clinic Program for the past 30 to 35 years. Uh, my partner is Danny Gilbert with a CPA certified Rural Health Clinic professional with us as well. She's not worked for for uh, in the RAC program for 30 or 35 years, so she's not even that old. But uh, she's she is as you probably well know the brains of this operation. So so Danny will be taking care of the technical piece of the webinar as far as questions and things in the background uh, that you have. Uh, what we do at Healthcare Business Specialists is prepare Medicare cost reports. That is the majority of our work. Uh, we do program evaluations, uh, help you become RHC, do some emergency preparedness work. And if you're in Tennessee, we do the 10 care quarterly reports as well. More accurately, Danny does the 10 care quarterly reports. Just, because I could not do this. If you've not joined the RHC Information Exchange Group, we have 3,300 members right now. Uh, it is an invaluable uh, place to ask questions. People like Charles James answers questions for, for people. Kate Hill comes, comes in there. Mark is a part of it. So there's a lot of great consultants out there that are very helpful in this session as well so you are in the exchange group so we'll want to you'll want to join that uh, if you're in face if you're on facebook a lot of people aren't in facebook again we're having the webinars over the next uh, two months or so there's going to be typically a webinar on every tuesday and thursday we are really doing a deep dive into rhc billing over the next the next few weeks so you'll if you're brand new to rhc billing that's going to be great. Uh, next week, Charles and I and Jonathan Pattenberg and uh, several people are going to be doing, um, Elizabeth Burroughs on grants. We're going to do an update uh, session on next on next Tuesday. So you'll want to join us uh, for that. That is, that is just, like I said, an update. It's not going to give you the basics that this billing sessions are going to be, but this will give you this expects you to have some knowledge and be an update. So it's time for our sponsor message there. There's Charles, you wanna take it over and just, just tell us a little bit about North American um, Healthcare Management Services and what you guys do. I thank you, Mark. I, I love the picture Mark pulls that was from a uh, NRHA Policy Institute in DC, that one's probably three, five years ago. I'm not sure which. Uh -huh. um, actually, that one was just pre-pandemic. Uh -huh. Mark and Kate and I just were at the NRHA Policy Institute virtually just the past few days. So uh, I've been out there in the RHC world for a long, long time in a lot of different capacities. We really appreciate Mark's generosity and how he handles his webinars and sponsorship and everything that he does and has done for the RHC community. This is a fantastic forum. So we just appreciate the ability to be here. I like to tell everybody, we do a lot of real health clinic consulting, but at our core, I consider us an EHR hosting and billing company. We specialize in rural health clinics. We really do top to bottom rural health clinic work. And we're down in the trenches on billing issues all day, every day. I do want to plug our accountable care organization that we have put together specifically for rural health clinics and FQHCs. And so far we have 17 members and we're always looking for more participants. So if you're a rural health clinic that want to get in on value-based payments, <clears throat> excuse me, and join an ACO, the Rural Advantage, email me about it. I'd love to talk to you about it. So Mark, thank you for convening us and I look forward to hearing what Angie has to say. Uh, thank you, Charles. And that, that sounds exciting about the, uh, about the ACO. So I know a lot of rural health clinics have not 
had the opportunity to participate in those in the past, and that's a growing, growing thing in a way to uh, to help your revenue stream. So definitely want to talk to Charles about how you can participate in uh, the ACO. Uh, we also have a number of panelists here. They're going to be able to. This is this is going to be a group effort uh, to to get everybody caught up on this program evaluation. So Mark Schultz is with uh, Midwest Healthcare, and uh, Mark, you want to do a quick introduction to everybody and tell us just a little bit about yourself and about what you do. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I'm Mark Schultz with Midwest Healthcare, manager of consulting services. Uh, I've been with the company for a little over three years, but what we do is rural health consulting as well, rural health uh, certifications, program evaluations. Uh, we also do cost reports. Then we have a, a our fastest growing department is our enrollment and credentialing department. And then we do, of course, uh, medical billing. That's uh, that's a little bit about Midwest Healthcare and what we do. I appreciate you having me, Mark. Okay, All right. thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, and then next up is she definitely needs no introduction. Kate Hill with the compliance team. Uh, like Charles said, Kate and I, Charles and Kate and I have been in in the Virtual Policy Institute for the last three days, which I apologize for the bad timing on this. I completely forgot that that was going on uh, when I scheduled this, but uh, I think I think we got the majority of the of the sessions in. I know uh, Kate spearheaded uh, some really great sessions with with us on RHC matters. So Kate, you wanna? Tell everybody a little quick quick about yourself and about uh, the compliance team. Sure, I'm a, I'm at uh, <laughs> I'm Kate Hill. I'm in Pennsylvania with the compliance team, and we're an accreditor. We accredit rural health clinics for uh, RHCs, PCMH. We do pharmacy, DME on the other side. Then I'm on the clinic side, and we're delighted to be here today and talk to you. Listen to Angie talk about um, the biennial evaluation. Okay. All right, and Cindy. Uh, I, don't, I didn't warn you that I was going to put you on the spot there, but uh, Cindy Mellinson with the compliance team as well. She's their regulatory strategic advisor, and Cindy has been around CMS a long time. I know Kate and Cindy and I, we had a little uh, a little session on old program memorandums that I was probably, I thought I would be the only one old enough to be pulling these out of the files, but Cindy knew all about those. So, Cindy, you want to say that? Let me just make a disclaimer that that is not Cindy. She's a bit older than than Michelle. That's one of oh, our. Oh, is, is that from your website there? So I'm yeah. sorry about that. I oh, we need to check that. Okay. Uh, and the other thing is um, that Cindy was not notified of this till about five minutes ago to be on camera, so she might not be camera ready. <laughs> uh, okay, she don't be on the camera. She can just tell us what's what's that's what's going right. on. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I work for the compliance team. I've been with the compliance team for about five years now, so I work very closely with Kate Hill. Um, prior to that, though, I worked at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and I worked there for about, I don't know, 16, 17 years. And uh, yes, Mark, Kate, and I had a great discussion on old memorandums and old regulations, and unfortunately, I am old enough to go way, way, way back. <laughs> <laughs> I was so glad to have somebody that, that actually remembered all that stuff from back in the day. I was like, I, I, thought, yeah, I, was making, well, I thought I was having a, a dream or something. So, yeah, so if you ever have any questions about old memorandums and CMS, just go ahead and give me a call or reach out through Kate and she can get a hold of me because we work very closely together. Okay. Uh, and, and I apologize for the picture. I had I had like a list of like four different pictures that I had to put put out. And I was like, well, there's a lot of Cindy Mellisons in the world. For, and so and I thought that was the one from the TCT website. Obviously, it wasn't. So and Elsie, uh, Elsie is invited. I don't think Elsie's here with us today, so we'll just skip skip that section of it. And uh, the disclaimer, uh, yeah, everything is as far as I know is up to date as of today. Uh, basically, uh, this is being recorded. So, if there's an issue with you with it being recorded, uh, please please get off of the session right now. If you don't like that, um, the slides are in your handouts. They're also in the Facebook group. I also emailed them uh, to everybody today, and uh, I did put them on our website. So, you should have access to the slides that were that we have here. Our speaker is Angie Chalet. She is with Charlotte with with um, Canopy. Uh, Director of Quality. I think everybody knows Angie. She was been the past um, past president of the National Association of Rural Health Clinics, and then she decided to take 
a job away from us and she loved us so much that that she knew as soon as she left us she knew that was a bad decision and came back to us so we're so thankful that she has so angie you want to say something real quick before we get started no i'm just excited to be here and our panelist group um just really looking forward to not just preparing this session but helping people along the way and you're going to get a lot of angieisms if you all know me from NARC, um, you're gonna get a lot of my thoughts as well. So looking forward to this. I will go off camera because I think it's better for the presentation. Um, and I am rural and so for internet capabilities, it does work better to not be on camera. Okay, and I will, I'm gonna stop sharing mine as well because you probably don't wanna see me anyway. So I'm gonna stop sharing my mine as well and uh let's just to do a very quick introduction to what program evaluation is uh, here's the definition a systematic method of collecting analyzing and using information to answer questions about projects policies and programs the way i like to think about it is it's sort of like a progress report i know when we we're doing startups we typically will have meetings with our clients and we'll the first thing we do is we always start with the progress report what did we what did we plan on getting accomplished and what did we get accomplished and what are we going to do uh, in the future same thing with the program evaluation on an annual basis you should be doing this it's it's only required every other year but do you go in and get a, a physical every two years every three years every five years or do you get an annual physical and really you should be getting in that annual physical where you're getting the vital your vital signs are being checked to see if you're if you're functioning properly as as a healthy human being same thing with your rural health clinic you want to check your vitals you want to see what your visits are are you growing uh, are you providing the services that are needed in your community what is your patient satisfaction uh, and then it's a great way to create a nice report sit around a table and go over those sort of things sort of you know and we've had so many things that have hit us in the last 24 months with covid we've had uh responding to covid we've had vaccine mandates we've had this no surprises a uh, billing that's coming out we've had prf fund reporting and so it's a good place to sort of come together and go over all those types of things uh, that's happened and what's going to happen and just sort of do some planning uh, for your rural health clinic and again it's it's every other year and if if you don't do it for the right reason which would be those reasons uh you are sort of forced to do it you have a it is one of the condition levels uh deficiencies it's one of the conditions of participation to be a rural health clinic is you have to have a program evaluation the, the condition right now is every two years you have to do one of those so and what we've seen and the reason why we did this webinar today is every month i'm getting one of our clinics calling me up and said, we just got an inspection and we have 30 days or 45 days to get a program evaluation done, to get our emergency preparedness uh, up to speed, to review our policies and procedures. This whole list of about 35 pages of stuff they have to fix. And that's not a great place to be in. Uh, it's expensive and it's stressful and nobody's happy when that happens. So we want you to avoid uh, that stress and that expense of having to rush and do everything very quickly to save your status here. So this is when I went into, there's something called QCOR and QCOR lists out all the deficiencies that are cited for RHCs and basically half of them relate to program evaluation and emergency preparedness not being up to speed in these inspections. So if you want to pass your inspections with flying colors, Half of the half of the test is going to be to make sure that you do your program evaluation and your emergency preparedness. At least that's what people are missing uh, the most, anyway. And so, why is there so much confusion regarding what you have to do with program evaluations? Like I said, Cindy and and Kate and I had a I made the horrible mistake of going back into 45 years of, of rules and trying to trying to start from the beginning. There's a saying about you know you don't want to see sausage and laws being made. I found that to be very true when I went back through those 45 years of stuff. So, so uh, the National Association of Rural Health Clinics, which if you're not a member, please join. It is a great organization. It's the only national organization specifically designed to lobby 
and and support rural health clinics. And so Bill and Nathan and Sarah and Shannon and all that group that works with, with them are doing a fantastic job supporting you. So, so uh, legally binding, this is statute. This goes back to public law 95-210. It is legally binding. There's also REC regulations, which are legally binding that come out every so often. You have a, they come out in proposed rules and then they, then they have a final rule and then they're, they're implemented 60 days after the, after the fact. And then there's something called RHC guidance. That is Appendix G. That's where there's a little bit of leeway on that. That's how CMS interprets the regulations and they give that to the surveyors and then the surveyors use that uh, to, to uh, inspect and survey your clinics. And so what we tell our clients is when they're becoming a new rural health clinic is whenever the surveyor shows up, you call us and let us know they're there. And if they ask for something weird that you don't know about, then call us and let us talk to them or give them some information if it's not the way that we think it should be. I know in Kentucky, we have a lot of Kentucky clients. For some reason, they always ask, uh, do you have a license? And do you have a, uh, do you, there's a fire marshal been here? And did you pay $500? And like, we have to tell them every time that, you know, that law went away four years ago. <laughs> and so occasionally you get stuff like that. And, uh, but this is guidance. It's not, it's not, binding, uh, but uh, you, you may get some some little strange things from that as well. So, and then I call this the three pillars of RHC oversight. Public law 95-210 is when this all started in 1977. I was actually a high school senior in 1977. So, so uh, and then here's your regulation. This is really what you need to pay attention to. Uh, if you go into Cornell, they have a website that has the regulations listed out for you. It's electronic, so it's up to date. That's probably where you wanna spend your time in making sure you know the what regulation. And that was my sort of fatal error was I went back through statute and oh, oh, memorandums and oh, I was I went down a rabbit hole that I should not have gone down. So so uh, that, um, and then uh, we, we you will see, things that talk about things being done annually, reviewing your, your patient care policies and your program evaluation. The requirement right now is every other year, except for Louisiana. Louisiana still has a state law that says you have to do your program evaluation every year and review your policies and procedures uh, every year in Louisiana. So make sure if you're in Louisiana, you do that. Uh, if you're not in Louisiana, the best practice is for you to do this report uh, every year every year. And even if you don't do the whole full pretty report, if you just have that meeting where you take that physical, where you do that progress report and, and, and keep notes on it, uh, you definitely need to do this uh, every year. So that's, that's my piece of this. And I will shut up and turn, uh, I'm going to make Angie the presenter. And so she can, so she can tell you. All right. There you go, Angie, you are in control. Oh, tell me again which screen you're seeing. Um, it looks good on my part. Okay, all right. So let's dig in. Um, I will again reiterate, just like Mark was sharing, this is something that I truly believe is good to do yearly. You know, annually look at your data. Um, when you look at two-year-old data, it is, again, two-year-old data. So, you know, I know it's only to be required biannually. I still am a firm believer in doing this annually. And like I said, you're going to get some angeisms as we go through this. So as an RHC, you have nine conditions of participation. Here they are listed out, and we're going to look at number eight. Now, I'm going to touch on a few others in this presentation, but really we're looking at your program evaluation and looking at what needs to be included. All right. Oops, it's not going. Here we go. All right. So in the guidance, it tells us when we're supposed to do it biannually. It tells us what we should be doing that utilization of clinic or center's services, at least the number of patients served in the volumes of services. And I'm gonna show you some examples as we go through. A representative sample of both your active and closed clinical records, 
the clinic or center's healthcare policies. And then the why, why are we doing this? Here it is. Are you doing the best for your community? You know, are you meeting your community's needs? You know, it's a utilization of services. They were appropriate for your clientele. We are looking at the established policies. Were they followed? You know, were any changes needed? It's a true picture of your clinic. And then, you know, the clinic or center staff considers the findings of the evaluation and takes corrective action if necessary. Now you'll see in some of the guidance, it may talk a little bit about QAPI programs. And that's really kind of in that evaluation. What kinds of corrective action did you do? What are you doing for your quality assurance performance improvement as part of your annual program evaluation or biennial? And what have you done that has worked well and not worked well? So the procedures itself, you know, this just gives you a quick rundown. Everybody likes visuals. I am definitely a visual person. I like to see things that, you know, kind of down and dirty. You know, is there evidence that it was completed at least biannually? Is there evidence that a review of representative sample of the records was completed? Does the sample include the minimum required number? Who conducted what? And evidence, again, you'll see evidence as far as recommendations from the review. You know, what was truly required. All right, so what is our outcome? You know, what's that deliverable when we do this? So we may use clinic personnel to do this. We may use outside sources. The professional advisory group is the one that reviews it and signs our report. Now I wanna to touch on this. I often get asked, you know, do I have a consultant do this or do I do it on my own? That is truly up to each clinic's preference. But here's what I'm gonna give you a little angieism on this. When you use an outside person, a consultant, you know, we have lots of us on this call right now, they give you a different perspective. They may give you a different look at how the report was done. They may view your data differently. You know, they may see something you don't see. You know, when you do your mock surveys, oftentimes some things become white noise. You know, we're just used to seeing it that way. Whereas that different perspective, when you have your truth survey, it looks a little different because other people view things differently. So I do want to put that caveat in there. You know, when you look at, do I buy or do I build? You know, this does give you a perspective. Now, the other deliverable with this is you don't have to have a true meeting, although I do like meetings um, because I like to review it and kind of talk about the findings, but it can be a virtual meeting and it, um, there is a paper shuffle for signatures. So that final report should be um, in your evidence binder and ready for your RHC surveyor to view. You know, that is something that they will ask in that evidence binder is what was done. And then they're gonna kind of look at it and say, okay, so what was done, you know, to continue on in this performance improvement? What did you do with this information? So what do you wanna accomplish? Are we compliant with our regulations? Are we following our policies and procedures? Are we meeting our patients' expectations? Now, patient satisfaction surveys are not required um, per CMS in the guidance, but they are a great thing to do. And if you choose to go with an accrediting body, they may ask you to do these. And don't think of it as a burden. Think of it as a, I just wanna know your feedback. And I don't look at them as patient satisfaction. I look at them as patient engagement. I want your feedback. What can we do better? Are we meeting your expectations? You know, are we giving you what you need? And then any benchmarking data, especially if you are part of, you know, as Charles mentioned, an ACO, do you have any other additional benchmarking data that you want to look at and evaluate? How am I performing against others? Um, NARC and WIPFLE have a program, so if you're a member of NARC, you can get it for free through WIPFLE, you know, looking at some of that benchmark data. Great way to really identify some of your areas of opportunity. Is the patient volume meeting our expectations? Are we getting who we think we should be getting in our clientele, in our community? You know, are we reaching our goals? You know, is there something we need to be looking at? You know, new opportunities. 
And then we look at what do we need to change and what is that plan to change? So as we go through the program eval, we're going to review and update our policies and procedures. You know, are we doing what we have written that we are going to do? We're going to review some records, both active and closed, and I'll talk about this in a minute. And then that walkthrough inspection of the facility. We're going to look at any regulatory, compliance, billing, cost report changes. You know, and again, I highly encourage outside views of this you know, and looking at one of the consultants to really dig in on the billing, the cost reporting changes. Update the evidence binder. Again, make it fresh. So when your surveyor comes in, everything is ready to go. Determine if you are meeting the HIPAA expectations, OSHA, CLEA regulations, you know, all part of those nine components as an RHC. And then present that utilization of your data to the clinic. Hey, look at, here's what we did you know, make it shine, you know, or, you know, maybe we had a little dip in something. Let's look at that, that benchmarking. Your emergency preparedness, I um, cannot stress that enough. I know we're not really talking about that on this call, but please, please, please make sure your emergency preparedness is up to date. Your drills and after action reports are present. And then cite any of your deficiencies that you found. All right, visits and utilization. So Angie version, I like graphics. Uh, you know, to give me a table of data is a challenge for me. I am a visual person. So I like to see, you know, the data in bar graphs or a trend line or something to really say, okay, did I have an up or down? You know, am I kind of maintaining where I'm at? So this just gives you a look and an example of what can be done when you are looking at your description of your utilization. And then we continue on into our utilization of services. And this is where I really want you to think about, okay, who am I serving? You know, what's my age and gender of my clientele that are coming in? Has it shifted? You know, am I seeing more patients in the 60, 65 range? Or maybe I'm starting to see a shift and those millennials are starting to move into our area in the rural sectors. And we're starting to see more of that 20, 30 year olds. You know, what kinds of patients are we seeing? That commercial, you know, payer, the Medicare, Medicaid, are we seeing more self pay? What are we seeing? What are our top 10 diagnoses? You know, if I am in a mining community, am I seeing more in respiratory? Or if I'm in, you know, some other industry area, am I seeing something different? Our lab services. Now I've been in a lot of clinics and some clinics have just the main six and some clinics have a very robust lab. So what are we seeing? What are we doing? What are we ordering? You know, if it's available, if we're offering radiology or anything else, you know, how often are we doing that service? You know, what does the data look like and the trends? And then we also look at some of those referral patterns. Have we had an uptick in ortho or podiatry? Or maybe we need to bring a specialist to the area because they're all going out, you know, work in collaboration with our hospitals. You know, I don't know, you know, but again, just looking at that referral service, you know, and then, you know, are we referring to the same one and is it consistent? And looking at, again, how we can improve. So, and then we have our financial charges and cost data. Now, I will tell you, I am not a numbers person when it comes to anything financial. You know, this is where our experts come to play. But again, are we seeing an uptick in Medicare visits? Are we seeing a charge per visit change? You know, this is where those experts really look at the data and say, okay, here's what we're seeing. This is your trend and this is what it means. You know, so again, new fresh eyes is always valuable. Policies and procedures, hmm. we love those, don't we? So have we had any changes? Did we add any services? Now, if we added services, did we have a policy or a procedure that matches or something that states that? Did we delete some things? Maybe we did away with radiology. Maybe we did away with ultrasound or something else. Did you remove the policies from that? from your services. How are you measuring that your policies are being followed? 
So this is that, you know, did my staff create a workaround? And I will tell you all staff have workarounds. Um, this is just kind of a known. Um, and this is really good to identify when you are doing your mock survey or your walkthrough. Ask the staff, how do you do this? How do you ensure that the consent is completed at the time of visit on an annual basis or every visit every time that, you know, determining, you know, what are they doing? We look at that and then we may talk to staff as mock surveyors. And on top of this, we're going to go back and look for that policy and validate. Yes, my policy states I'm doing it this way. Yes, staff also validated in my walkthrough that this is what they're doing. And then you do need that signed approval of your policy and procedure review. You'll see here an example from one clinic. Um, this is what they did, their status. It was locked, it was retired, it was due soon. Again, it doesn't really matter how you track that, but it just gives you an example. Somebody have a question? Okay. And protocols, what are protocols? They're that written authorization to provide medical aspects of patient care, which is agreed upon through the advanced practice nurse, physician assistant, and their collaborating physician. They review and sign these at least annually, and they're maintained in the practice setting. Now, I will tell you the gold standard is up to date. I will also tell you when I've done some mock surveys, I've seen a lot of other resource tools that are very dated in the clinic. Um, the one that comes to mind off the top of my head is a PDR, and it was in um, a little rural clinic, and the physician, I don't know, he might have been 70, 72-ish, and his PDR was dated from 1998, and I'm like, are you still using this? Yeah, periodically I open it up. I'm like, oh, no, don't do that. So, you know, if you look at something online, a subscription, talk to your reps that come in, your um, drug reps, you can probably get something free from them. But it is a great way to always stay up to date, you know, just like it states up to date. And you don't have those older resources sitting around. All right, quick review of where we're at so far. Understanding that purpose of your program evaluation. You've reviewed all of your services. Are there any significant findings? You know, that year over year trend. You know, what is the data saying? You know, what changes were made in the past year or two years? And, you know, we're all in it right now in COVID. Well, how has that impacted your volumes, your testing, your immunizations? You know, how you're treating patients. You know, are we doing more virtual telehealth visits? Do we have more in drive up car visits that changed the status and changed things that we are doing? Did we change our hours of operation? You know, other things that we're looking at are those patient satisfaction results. And again, they don't have to be re robust. Ask just a couple questions. You know, three questions is great if you can get the patients to answer those three questions. Put it on a tablet, put it on just a simple postcard, have them fill it out before they leave and drop it in a box. Are we having any acute versus chronic visits? You know, are we seeing a trend differently? And what corrective action are we taking? What are we going to do differently, you know, to improve this opportunity that we found? Okay, open and closed record reviews. This one I know gets a little bit confusing, but there's two forms here you see, the patient chart audit and then that collaborative medical record audit. So our patient chart audit, um, that can be assigned to any of the staff members. I personally think having nurses go through this or your LPNs or your CMAs, you know, folks that are in the records, it's good to do these. And the reason is because they will start to identify areas of opportunity they may have missed. Um, when I did these at the hospital, I also encouraged, you know, the hands-on staff to do some of these as well as those that are not hands-on because it does help identify some things. Now, our patient ID, who their provider is, patient social data, do we have their insurance information, their payer mix? 
their allergies. Consent to treat, I cannot tell you enough about how many charts I've been through and that consent to treat is not updated. What's their reason for their visit? Do we have their medical history updated? Is the medication reconciliation completed and updated? The visit notes, obviously we want in there. Labs and testing that might be ordered. And this is where if you are doing chronic care management or if you're part of an ACO, it's also looking at, okay, did I follow through with that? You know, and again, you know, I may order several labs and the labs come back and I forgot, I missed them. I didn't call them back to the patient. How can you fix that? Any other orders, referral patterns, you know, and am I getting those referrals back? Are the patients going to their referrals? The provider signature and patient education from their visit or that visit summary, depending on your EMR that you have. Now, the collaborative medical record is between the physician and the nurse practitioner or physician assistant. You know, again, looking at that data service, that patient history, it was captured, the reason for their visit. They did a review of symptoms, medications they reviewed, they ordered, they changed. Their plan, their treatment, that they also provided some patient education, that they ordered some tests and any notes or feedback that they may have for that provider. Closed records. Closed records are those patients that have left for one reason or another. They may have transferred to a different provider, they moved out of the area, and you know they may have died. And how, how you manage to track those is a clinic to clinic um, decision, you know, especially for patient deaths. Now, if a patient does request a transfer um, because they are moving out of the area or something, um, you will be able to then say, okay, this is a closed record. So, but a best practice is really to always review all closed records if possible and really make sure that you had captured everything throughout that patient um, engagement time and make sure that, you know, we're using it as a learning tool as well. So again, the regs state what you should have in your Appendix G, you know, looking at, you know, our medical chart, we have identification and social data, evidence of consents, pertinent medical history. Again, just everything we just reviewed, create a checklist, make it simple, you know, and keep it so that you can continually have an ongoing trend of data. Here is another one. This is off of the Rural Health Information Center. Um, again, it's just a nice, quick, down and dirty of all of my checks, you know, and making sure that I am meeting all of those targets. All right, and then the physician component of this, again, the evaluation is representative of a specific sample of 5% or 50 records, whichever is less. Now, I recommend doing 15 a quarter versus 10 a quarter. 10 a quarter gives you 40, you know, whereas 15 a quarter will give you 60. So a little bit overachieving, but again, it does, you know, provide some guidance. If your state says you need more, then that is what you need to do for that nurse practitioner or PA, depending on what their scope of practice rules state. So, and I have been in some clinics that it is just standard that the collaborating physician reviews all records and that they sign off on them. And then obviously that federal requirement, the 5% or the 50 charts. Emergency preparedness. Again, this is not to really talk about emergency preparedness, but it does need to be addressed in your program evaluation. You know, what events took place this past year, two years? What findings or recommendations were made? Were the policies changed at all? Did you have to do something different? Now, we all know COVID is out there and you have that in your emergency plan. Really look at those after action reviews. Did you make some changes because of that? Were staff educated? Was it 100% of your staff? And then just a brief summary of that emergency plan. And what you see in the white section here is a one clinic's um, example of what they had put in their emergency plan. And again, this is what was done. We participated in a community-wide disaster drill. And then here's who participated and here's what we learned. You know, and the clinic operations closed to assist at the hospital setting. So again, if you have real life events, um, if you have a tornado or 
um, hurricane, depending on where you're located, you know, again, write those up and utilize those. If you had a citywide power outage, you know, write that up and use that. Mock surveys, I cannot stress enough about doing the mock surveys and don't do this every two years. I highly encourage you to do this annually, if not every six months, do a walkthrough of your clinic with fresh eyes. Um, find a template. You will see in some of the resources, the compliance team, our lovely Kate Hill has provided a very nice template and how to walk through and do your mock surveys. You know, again, this is one of those areas that really allows you to dig a little deeper. And it, are you doing what you say you do? It also allows you to engage all of the staff, you know, to be part of this. You're going to want to complete some chart audits. You're going to want to complete some HR files. You know, you're going to want to review that patient satisfaction, your performance improvement projects and expireds. Expireds in my mind is always that biggie. You know, how are you tracking that and what are you doing, you know, to help prevent that? Now we know there's going to be the ones and two Zs that are going to be kind of left behind somewhere. So, but again, looking at the process and are you following the process you said you would do? You know, and like I said, it is in the resources at the end of this presentation. So just in a kind of quick nutshell of what you look at in that program eval for your policies that are reviewed, we have our RHC policies, we have our billing policies, and then we have HIPAA OSHA. You know, and again, you know, look at that vaccine mandate, no surprise act, and add those into your annual review. Formal report, you do want some form of a formal report that's going to get signed off by others. And when we do this formal report, um, it will go in your evidence binder as well. We're gonna talk a little bit about your goals and objectives. What were your goals? What were you doing in this review? What was reviewed? Who reviewed it? You know, that utilization and services, those medical records, and they can be simple one or two lines of this is what was done and this is what was found. And then in your meeting minutes elsewhere outside of this report, can be all the data, or you can have them in appendix. It's totally your call how you want to do that. And the policy review, some demographics. I know it's not always required, but it's nice to have. I like to see the demographics of the community and the services provided. Think about your report as telling your story. It should paint a picture of what your clinic provides, how well it provides it, and who it provides it for. Identify your problem areas, your opportunities for improvement, any goals that you need to fix, and then truly shine on your achievements, what you've done in this last year, last two years. You know, those lessons learned and look at us, this is what we've done differently. That professional advisory group needs to sign the report, at a minimum, you know, it should be your medical director, your nurse practitioner, and or physician assistant, that non-member community representative. This is one example of a conclusion of one county's um, rural health clinics um, evaluation and what they came up with. And again, this is what we did, down and dirty, very simple. All right, so some resources. Um, as Mark had alluded to earlier, NARC provides a lot of really good resources. Um, I cannot say enough as a past president and nine years on the board of, I highly encourage everybody to be part of that, just like you were part of the um, Facebook page that we have out there. It really does provide a lot of good resources. If you go to one of the conferences, there's one in the spring, there's one in the fall consistently. That is a great time to meet these consultants and really kind of talk to them. On top of that, the programs are just invaluable um, and the takeaways that you get from those conferences as well as their technical assistance calls. So again, I just really, really encourage that. There are several good resources here. 
I know Shannon Chambers, um, also one of the NARC board members, I don't know if she is on with us today, she did a great presentation as well on the biennial evaluation. Um, again, the NARC resources, and I know Mark has plenty on his as well. And then again, um, Kate Hill, you know, with the compliance team. You know, when you talk about the compliance team and Quad A, both to the um, only accrediting bodies for RHCs, I cannot say enough about what they bring to the table um, versus, you know, just waiting on the state to come and accredit the RHCs. When you are with an accrediting body, you know, there is just so much more you get. You get education, you get ongoing um, training, you get newsletters, you get, hey, by the ways, you know, watch this, look for this, you know, what's coming down the pike. You know, they just really do provide a lot more information, updates, so you're not taken by surprise, you know, and you're not kind of left out there hanging when the state office may come in and do your um, RHC visit. So again, some great information out there. Vaccine mandate guidance, um, I, you, there's so much here. I'm not even gonna go through it, um, but again, you know, please get out there and look at this. And then that no surprises X resource. So again, this was done back in December of last year, um, sponsored by NARC. Please get out there and look at that. And with that, I am going to turn it back over. Um, so Mark, we can take questions now. All right, Angie, well, thank you very much. That was so good. So, so it must have been great because we don't have a ton of questions in the question pane over here. So everybody, if you want, um, I think we have one question, but before we go start answering questions, please type your questions in, or if you want to raise your hand and and uh, and want to ask the question verbally, we will open up your line for you. Uh, in the meantime, while we're accumulating those, I'd like to ask our panelists to sort of chime in and maybe give us some of uh, their best tips or their best or, or some of their experiences uh, with program evaluations and and uh, and help our audience to comply with those regulations. So, uh, uh, Kate, can I start off with you uh, on that one? If you guys will unmute your lines, we'll be ready to ready to talk and um, and we'll start accumulating questions from everybody. All righty. Well. Uh, whoops, we're back. And I just want to add one thing, and that is that the the uh, the work that you do through the two years, except for Louisiana, while you're getting to your biennial, is really, uh, you don't want to wait two years to look at these files. So yeah, it's not required to do them every month or every quarter, but you don't want to find a problem too late. You want to address it when you find it. And so, you know, a, a, whatever number you choose, it's your policy, unless your state tells you that you have a number, it's your policy that dictates how many. And so remember this, you are surveyed to your policy if the state doesn't give a number. So if you have 10 per quarter, 10 per month, whatever your number is, the surveyor is going to look for that number in your review sheets, and you're going to provide documentation that you did review 10 files and what you did about it. Don't forget that. Even if it's perfect, then write that sentence. It's perfect, and we didn't need to make any changes, or we found that so-and-so is not signing off on her charts, the med list isn't complete, whatever. So I think that's probably my best advice on that one so far. Okay. Charles, do you have something you want to add on program evaluations? I know you and I, we have such a love for program evaluations. It's, <laughs> it's a, we've, we've, we've sort of commiserated about about what an agony it is to drive nine hours and spend a day in a clinic and then write a report and have a meeting and then drive home and and so but Charles what do, what do you got about program evaluations man you know but on this on the other hand I sure got to see a lot of places yes. that nobody knows are out there right and and but you're right it can be fairly grueling and repetitive and I, you know, I guess what I was sitting here thinking about were the various collaborative agreements or collaborative requirements that we have across states. Mm -hmm. And that so often we get conflated and confused between what our collaborative requirement says and what is the rural health clinic requirement, or we put something in our collaborative requirement, like we'll confer on site once every two weeks 
where you don't have to put that in the collaborative requirement if you're in a state that doesn't require it. So a lot of times on those collaborative agreements in rural health clinic work where we get confused on what's required by being collaborative versus the RHC requirements. So don't subject yourself to more than you need to is a big thing. And when, if you've been a rural health clinic for a long time, and you're taking over a new role in a long time rural health clinic, when you uh, have, we don't get a good answer on why you're doing something. Why are we doing this? Well, because we're required to for rural health. You know, question that. Are, are we really, you know, if it sounds something unreasonable, a lot of times we're inheriting tasks that people thought were required for rural health that really don't have anything to do with it. And this program evaluations and listening to, to content like this is a really good opportunity to think, oh, man, um, or conversely, things that you really, most of the things that we do as rural health clinic are really things when you get down to it, you should be doing anyway. Yeah. Some of our clinics are not, you know, you've been a rural health clinic a while, a full-blown program evaluation every year. Sometimes I get embarrassed to go. But if you haven't been a rural health clinic and you've had a lot of problems or you've inherited a mess, you know, so sometimes that can be situational too. So make sure and tailor a program that addresses your rural health clinic's needs. Ultimately. Okay. So thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you. That's excellent. That's excellent. Mark, do you have anything for? I know you, you, you're on, you guys with Midwest are on the road all the time, so you burn up, you burn up the uh, interstate. So, what, what can you tell us about your program evaluations that you guys are? We do, doing? we do, and you know, the first and foremost, I would say about program evaluations, they will differ state to state, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure Kate and Charles have seen that, and you, you as well that. It's amazing how they differ from state to state. What we talk about, the pains in Missouri may not be a pain in Kansas or, or down in Texas. It's just, it just is absolutely amazing that that uh, that it can be so different. We have a state survey, hence why we always encourage accreditation surveys. You get the same thing every time, uh, and know what to expect. But you know, kind of what uh, building off what Charles said, I constantly go through uh, uh, policy binders. Just went through one yesterday, and they hold themselves to a higher standard than necessary kind of like going to the annual uh, program evaluations. While I agree 100%, you shouldn't wait two years, you should do it annually. You should have a meeting annually, every six months, as Angie uh, mentioned. Still, change your change your policy to biannual, just to, just to hold yourself to that standard. I think sometimes chart reviews, say you're gonna do um, the minimum amount of chart reviews that are necessary, 50. If you do 60, 80, great, but don't hold yourself to a higher standard than uh, than what's necessary. I see that quite often. And when it, and when a state surveyor comes through and looks at your, if you didn't change the wording, they're gonna expect to see that annual program evaluation versus your uh, biannual. And, and lastly, building off what Aunt Angie said, if you're not using an outside consultant, change up who's doing the uh, reviews in the clinic each time you do a walkthrough, have a different individual each time. If you, if you, have, a, uh, if you have a checklist for, for expired items in the clinic, have a different nurse, uh, uh, nurse assistant, whoever that does that, switch rooms every month. People that look at the same room every month, every time they walk in, they look at it, they say oh, everything looks the same as last month, they hit their little check mark, we're all good. And then somebody new comes in behind them and goes, hey, look at this. I mean, those are just a few of the tidbits that I've seen. Good advice. That, that's excellent. Okay, and then, um, Cindy, do you have anything you want to add to uh, the conversation? No, I'm good right now. Thank you. Okay. All right, all right. We just we want to give you the opportunity. Um, Danny, let's go into these these questions here. Um, let me see here. Um, um, let's see. Keisha asked if the physician is signing off on every visit and meeting the advanced pr um, practitioners weekly. I guess that's a nurse practitioner weekly. Uh, meeting with them weekly, do we still need to perform uh, chart audits? Um, anybody want to take that one? 
Sure, I'll, I'll hit it. So what happens with that? We review every week of every chart. Is there where? How do you document that? What does it look like? You have to show the surveyor what it is. And I wouldn't want to be held to, to Mark's point. I wouldn't want to be held to 100% for survey. Now we're going to look at every chart and make sure they're all signed off. Not a good plan. So I, I mean, that's great if they think they need to do that. I'm, that's wonderful, but I would come up with a number and then have a, a way to, to show the survey or what was reviewed. Anybody agree, disagree with that? Kate, I completely agree. I mean, what I always tell people is what's in what, what's in Angie's slide is that there's two different there's two different things you have to worry about. Scope of practice is that 20 percent? Is it 100 percent? Let's focus on that for that. And then for our federal piece, we've got a checklist. We've got that 491.11 or whatever that was. It gave us a listing of things that should be in a medical chart. Let's review that for that minimum 50 every year and check that box as well so hold that's on, the way hold i on, describe hold on right there we're confused this has nothing that question in my mind has nothing to do with program evaluation nothing this is about medical oversight of the NPs and PAs. Physician yeah. is not doing uh, quantity quality review. He's doing medical oversight review. So that's so commonly confused. Let's let's yeah. separate those two. There's yeah. a reason that the physician and an MD or DO only looks at the NPPA's charts to make sure their care is what it should be, what he expects. We write, yeah. We're using the right meds. We're using the right doses. Those we're ordering the right tests. That kind of thing. That's very different than program eval. Completely yeah. different. And it yeah. does get confused very often. Yeah, and that's why I said we keep them two separated because they're two separate sort separate of Separate animals, processes. two completely separate animals. Yeah, you wouldn't want an MD, probably not anyway, doing your uh, QI. No. <laughs> a good idea. You're on mute, Charles. Charles, we can't hear you. Oh, I have double muted. I'd like to say it's, it's, it's a qualitative review that the collaborator does. Right. It's really kind of a quantitative checkbox that we do on the on the survey piece in a lot of ways. It, it's a on the RHC side, it's really a, we're making sure that it, the chart is complete. Correct. We're on the medical providers making sure that the care was appropriate, right? And we really can't judge the care on this on the REC survey side. I can't. No, <laughs> no, no we're, we're not qualified. Yeah. We're not qualified, right? <laughs> And so, one thing I'd like to say about the overburden thing that Mark mentioned, part of the problem when we overburden ourselves, we're already stressed out. And then we have another task that seems insurmountable, so you just don't do anything. And I see a lot of folks do that. Or, oh man, no, I thought it was 100 charts per month that we had to do for real health. And no. So... You know, make sure it's like anything else. Make sure where you're getting your information, which is why it's good. Your yeah. And then next question here is from Glenda, and I'm gonna give this one to Mark because I I think your answer was good on the 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 earlier question was 15 medical charts per provider or per clinic is Glenda's question. So um, I think it, I think it, it, is 15, be. it is 15 per clinic, 50 cumulative. I like to mix it up amongst the providers, but it is not 50. You do not have to do 50 charts per provider. That's, that, that was going to be my answer on that one, too. So, so, And I think what you said earlier was, was look at your policy. Have your policy set for the minimum. If you go over it, great. Nobody's going to put strikes against exactly. you for going over. But uh, but set it at 50, which I, I think I need, to, I need to change. It. I've always put 15 per quarter, but I need to change it to 50 per year. And then then that'll give us some more leeway. So that's, that's that works. I learned just as much from these things as you guys. Do, Again, so. that's by your policy, unless the state and I don't think any state dictates on the QI only on the medical oversight so that's you have to have a policy how many you're going to review and throw them into a folder. And then when you get to the two years, you've got a nice, healthy, healthy group of files. Absolutely. Okay. And then um, next question is when the physician reviews the nurse practitioner's charts, is it acceptable to keep a log of the ones reviewed if the physician signs off and says that he reviewed the chart as an addendum in the EHR? Probably not the best practice. I don't know. Kate or Mark, do you? Uh, not, only, not only acceptable, it's required. We, we look for that log. Okay. You know, we there's billing issues, and and Charles and Mark, you can comment on that. But when you when you put your name in a in an audit on the chart file, I've heard this before. So we look. Here's the ten names. It's in the clinic. It's PHI. It's kept secure. And there's the ten charts I reviewed, signed by Mark MD. Okay. 
Okay. What time? So, hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out the, the let's, let's, do I understand the uh, question then? Uh, are we saying as opposed to counter to signing in the chart itself, like counter signing? If, well, if you can counter sign in the chart and you show us a report, that's acceptable that they were done. Those were counter signed. I have been told by some other billers, obviously not anybody on this call, that that can cause billing problems. Now, I, that's not my area, so I won't go further on that. But if it works, it's fine, as long as you can produce a report that shows what's reviewed and it matches your policy or the state. Yeah, some, Mark, what, what did you want to add there? You what, like I, what I was going to say was what I have seen, and, and I, I, was, I always don't recommend people doing this, is for, for your program evaluation. Again, this is a completely separate thing, so maybe this is what's confusing about this. And this is what, this is what confuses people, is for a program evaluation, what they want to do is say, okay, uh, here's here, we saw Mark Lynn today, here's his chart number, and the physician signed off on it. So that's our quality review of our 15 charts each quarter. And I'm like, no, that was the physician doing medical stuff and looking at the soap notes and making sure that yes, we were doing the right thing. We signed off on the nurse practitioner. So instead of instead of having that report where uh, you go through and you do all the check marks, the quality check marks, they use that instead of that quality check mark. And that's that's where I was thinking, no, we really that's two different processes. Does that make? But but you're saying if they do have the listing that that um that that's okay that, for that's physician good. oversight absolutely okay all right all right see I, I, again i learned so much of these things so we no, but make... part of me wants to say this is the other part of me says forget about real health and forget about everything else what would my malpractice insurance company say and so just what i'm getting nervous of is is if somehow these Rural health clinic processes replace your collaborative requirement under state law. You know, you've got, you know, you, you don't want to mix and match those. So I would say, okay, well, my, my malpractice insurer would want me to make sure I'm signing the minimum number of charts for my collaboration and make sure I'm towing the line there. So, yeah, the chart log's great. How would the RHC surveyor reply, but am I doing everything I can from a liability and legal perspective as well? Well, and that's where it goes to the highest standard. If the collaborative agreement spells that out or the state spells that out, that's what you have to do. We have states with autonomy, complete autonomy. Yeah, right. And so we don't have collaborative agreements, you know, and we just still have to do chart review. Mark, what would you think about that? Well, my the biggest thought I have on that, I agree with everything you guys have said, is do not wait until it's audit time to find out if your EMR can actually audit that. Uh, we constantly, constantly see that. Oh, it's in the EMR. Okay, go get that report. And it's the first time they've ever ran that report, and they go, ooh, I don't know where that report. I don't think we can. Great point. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a the other thing that that with the program evaluation is that when you're using a paper to sign a consent, a piece, literally a piece of paper make sure they get scanned in. They gotta get scanned in. They gotta make it into the EMR, okay? And and that's a, a pretty consistent problem we see. Not They don't all are missing, but some are missing. Okay, uh, let me see here. Our next question, I think it's pretty similar uh, to the one we just had. I understand our collaborative agreement review requirements and we are, cons and we are consistently uh, completing through the, through the patient chart audits. Do you recommend completing monthly assigning a volume to each nurse um that is the question i mean my, my first response is I, I, it's it's whatever your policy is i think is what you is what you want to do there as long as you you know get the job done as far as the minimum scope of practice and the minimum patient uh quality then then you're good to go is there any other comments on that or that's hard to, i don't think the question is entirely clear on yeah. what you in there yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's whatever your policy is, is what you'll want to do there. Uh, can you direct us to uh, where a template of a program evaluation is that we can use it as guidance? That's Carla's question. I know that there was one, there's one in the, uh, there's one in the uh, presentation uh, that Angie had put together for us. And, uh, and then we have one on our website. The only problem is mine, 
uh, was done about 20 years ago. And I noticed that the J codes are wrong. So let me go in and update my J codes on there if you use that template, because, uh, uh, but I will do that. Do y'all know any resources that you guys know of as far as like templates uh, for program evaluations? Not really. The National Association of Rural Health Clinics, do they have one in there? If you're a member, they have a, a in there, but there's not one in there. Okay. I don't think so. Our RHI hub has one. I don't know how old it is, but there is one at RHI hub. Yeah, I we think that was the one I used too. I gave them the link uh, to that. Angie, do you know of any? I no, I I used yours in the past. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, I was going to say that thing. I've been to a lot of clinics all over the country, and I'll see that old template from 20 years ago, and I was like, I probably should have changed those J codes about 10 years ago. But uh, <laughs> okay, uh, let me see here. Next, we're almost finished here. Uh, how do we okay if you are an rhc that has a part of a large health system who writes the policies how do we show that providers have reviewed the policies yeah. that's a good question i guess inquidox would be a good way of, of doing that if they're using inquidox or typically what we do is we'll put together a we, we put together a sign a signature page in front of the policy procedure manual for every year you, you just sign off on that. You have your physician, your nurse practitioner, PA, and your outside member do that. So That's the best way. And then on some of the big systems, there's an intranet and they can show who's been in there and signed off. If you can print a report of some sort that shows they were signed within two years by the appropriate people, you'd be good. So it's, it's different a little bit in every system. The log is the best. The, uh, the one sheet of paper that says I signed, I read and studied the policies. Here's my signature. Three people. That was the most important part of our manual. That signature page was in the front. You know, yeah. the survey is going to go smoother. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then let's see here. Tony from Nosor is asking, does there need to be a minimum of 50 charts? I can't find the number specified in the CFR. There is no number in the regulations. No number. You pick the number. What is what's representative? You're going to do two a quarter. You're not getting a picture of what's going on in your clinic. So, but you do pick the number by your policy, and that's how you'll be surveyed based on that. I think the Good question, Tony. Only, the fifty is only in the state operations manual. Yes, that's right. That's yeah, right. exactly. Under and and to that to that point, for those of you that are not with the compliance team, and there are many of you that aren't, I'm sure, and you're state surveyed, the state surveyors tend to use Appendix G like it's a law. We get that, but I'll tell you what, it's very tough to appeal anything. If they cite you because you had 48, not 50, you, you're going to have a tough time winning, and we understand that. We survey to the law, not to the guidance, um, and so you just have to know that, that they're and it's, there are surveyors in every state. It seems like one in every state that gets you on something strange. I'll call it strange. Uh, and I don't know what to tell you to do about that, but just beware. If you know in your network, your state organization, you can find out you know, what our people are looking for in our state, you'd be well advised to find it or come with an accreditation organization. That's what we'd love to see. That is, yeah, we love the compliance team. You guys do a great job. And so we have a lot of clients there. I know, I know Mark and Charles use you guys a lot. So, so, um, and of course, Quad A does a great job too. I always tell people I'm agnostic. We always send them, send them out to both of you guys. And, and uh, so whoever comes out cheapest is the one we go with, but you guys I do a great say, job. You're, you're very good. Well, looking at the three of you, your clinics do well. And so, and so do, so do HSAs and so do uh, Inquiseeks that you do well because you're guiding them through the process. We, there's things we can't do as an accreditor except survey. And so we teach, but we can't give you things. And so um, when you have hire one of these folks, you'll do well in survey, I promise you. It's so nice that the, with the accreditation organizations now, compliance team, quad ASF, to have consistency. consistency. You know what to expect. Where we ha we didn't have that before, so it it is a big addition to the industry. Agreed. Yeah, I tell you, I, I tell you a little story about uh, West Virginia. We got we have a we have a system over there with seven RHCs, and we have there's this rogue surveyor in West Virginia that comes out and says that we had to have our program evaluation and the medical chart reviews could not be done by a physician that was that was had anything to do with our clinic and so we had to go back and out and hire a 
physician from another clinic in town to look through our policies and procedures and do our medical charts in order to pass the survey. Well, as soon as we got past our condition level deficiencies, we called up Kate and said, we want you as our surveyor because we want consistency. And so that's how you're gonna avoid these surveyors that, that do use that Appendix G, which there's some weird things in Appendix G that we don't necessarily agree with. So, so and here's what here's an example of one of these surveyors here. Uh, my my PA supervising MD is in another RNC. In the recent sur recent survey, the surveyor didn't want to accept the documentation that we had an MD review the PA charts. Uh, the surveyor said it should be done uh, by the facility medical director. That's exactly the opposite of what I just described. <laughs> and uh, so the surveyor wouldn't accept somebody from another clinic. So. I don't so, you know that would be an example where I'd pull up 49111 right out of the Federal Register and show her where it says medical doctor. It doesn't say medical director. Mm -hmm. So and that's her collaborating physician. That doesn't even make sense. So I, I understand the problem. I, I, I yeah, fixing it means coming with us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. We're good. I think the rest of them. I think we sort of got through those. We went over ten more minutes here. So any final thoughts uh, before we before we let everybody get back to, to doing what they were doing today. Um, okay, well, thank you guys. Thank you for our panelists. Angie, thank you so much for doing this. I think you did a fantastic job. Uh, and thank you for the group that's here today. Uh, we will be getting out uh, the, the um, we'll, we'll send you an email with the recording of this. So if you had to leave or you need to share it with other people in your facility, you can do that and it'll be on our YouTube uh, channel, so uh, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm I'm trying to make me some big bucks on YouTube, which I'm. <laughs> I, I want to see my first check ever come in from YouTube for for that. So, so thank hey, you Mark, very much. Mark, thanks, Mark. If, if anybody has any the topics they want to hear on, please let us know. You know, so we can provide that. You know, reach out to some of you know our experts out there in the field and bring those to the table. Absolutely, and. Yeah, the, the one thing I'll leave you with is if you, it, I know it's been a hard two years and probably some of this stuff has gone to the wayside. Now is the time to start looking at it again. And if you haven't done your program evaluations, call Mark, call Charles, call Angie, call, call Mark Lynn, call somebody and get those program evaluations going. Uh, there's a lot of great consultants out there that can do it. Um, and, uh, and get your emergency preparedness caught up. I mean, it's not fun to have to do this in 30 days. So, so. so parting advice, go get off the call and go look at the date of your program evaluation because we're finding them missed. And you know, the reason is COVID, you've been overwhelmed with so much, but go look right now. And if it's more than two years old, get working, yeah, truly. Yeah. All right, thank you all very much. I've been fantastic. Thank you, thank you all. Bye everybody.